I was able to piece together of what, what questions I wanted to ask, what did I need to hear, and start developing those relationships. And I think for me, I picked up early on that, you know, that relationship aspect is critical really trusting the sponsor, understanding what are they going to do when the the situation kind of goes from what was on the pro forma and on the page to reality. And Mm -hmm. as we talked about, we were prepping. I think I experienced that very early on in my investing experience, being that I started investing in late 2019. And we know what was around the corner at the beginning of 2020. So it was an interesting time to to kind of try out my might in this, this new investing space when I got started. Are you looking to grow your real estate business in 2023? If so, podcast guesting may be just what you need. To learn more about podcast guesting and how I can help grow your real estate business in 2023, go to podcastingu.com forward slash syndication to book your free discovery call. This is your daily real estate syndication show, and this is Dina Berg in for Whitney Sewell. Today's guest is Isaac Satin. Isaac is a passive investor in New York. And today he's going to share with us some of the things that he's learned in vetting sponsors and making the leap into passive investment, and then how he has reverse engineered some of his goals in spending more time with his family. Isaac and his wife have a unique path right now, but he talks about making special memories with his kids, doing simple things, and how passive investment has allowed him to do that. Isaac is full of energy and full of life, and I'm excited to welcome him to the show. Well, Isaac Satin, welcome to the show. I'm so glad that you're here. You and I have spoken several times before, and we've been talking about this, having you on the show for a long time. You are an outspoken advocate for multifamily real estate syndication, and you're just a good guy. I mean, it's just enjoyable to be around you. Your enthusiasm is contagious. And Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the kind words. And if you told me four years ago that I would be a guest on this show, I would have thought you were crazy. Um, So it's really just a full circle experience for myself as a passive investor getting to come on and chat with you today. That is wonderful. So let's talk a little bit about that. Maybe you could give us just a flyover of who you are, what you do in your day job. And then I just love to highlight passive investors. That's what this spot is about. And so we'd love to get into that after you kind of give us a little flyover of who you are. Sure, absolutely. So, I, I mean, I, I describe myself as, as kind of just a typical guy, married, two children, have had a professional sales career primarily for the last 15 years or so. I've moved in and out of sales and customer service and management and training and now more of a communications role. And yeah, kind of looked into real estate a couple of times early on, decided this is not for me. This is not my my type of style of investing you know, and, and continue to, to kind of glance at it. And it wasn't until I found kind of the syndication world that I really jumped in two feet first. Okay. And we had a little conversation before we got rolling. And I said, Isaac, most everybody has the same story. So if we could just skip over the whole, I started with single family rentals. I realized it wasn't time efficient. And, and you interrupted me and you said, no, that's not how I started. And I was like, great. So why don't you get us going? And take a swing at how did you get started in in multifamily investment and syndication or or just talk about your portfolio in general. You're you're invested in more things than just multifamily. Would love to hear about it. Yeah, I think for myself, like I said, my career has been in sales. I've been extremely fortunate and blessed that I've um, I have a knack for it. I guess so. I've done well over the years and been able to grow my a W-2 income that way. Around the time my daughter was born in, in 2015, it was like all right, I need to start figuring out how to do some investing, and I was looking into college investing. So kind of fell into the world of learning about equities and the stock market. And like I said, real estate kind of crossed over my page, but I was already owning a condo at that time. And I remember when a light bulb would go out, I turned to my wife and I'd say, oh, I, I guess we have to move now, you know, because <laughs> that's where, you know, people talk about toilets and termites and, uh, you know, I can't even fix the light bulb. I'm a short guy. So it required getting the ladder from downstairs. Are you um, a New Yorker? I mean, this is what <laughs> I am from that tri-state area. Yes. A lot of, a lot of apartment <laughs> living. This was when we lived in our, our condo. Um, so it was always ruled out for me of doing any type of, of single family investing, even in my local region or looking and doing turnkey. And I kind of put it out of sight, out of mind. And it wasn't until um, years later when I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts at the time called Millionaires Unveiled, I'll give them a little shout out here, where they just you know interview ordinary, everyday people who are either millionaires or on their way to becoming millionaires, a bunch of varied professions. 
And one thing I continued to notice that was in common was pretty much every other guest was talking about how they were invested in these real estate syndication deals. And they were part of these large apartment complexes. And that was kind of interesting to me because they talked about the hands-off nature of it, how they didn't have to do anything beyond their initial investment. Um, and at that point, I started scurrying around of, of how do I learn more about this? Where do I find out more about this? And to continue that story, arc, obviously, I went onto my favorite podcast player, typed in real estate syndication. Fortunately, there was somebody who had started a show a couple of months earlier called The Real Estate Syndication Show. And I remember finding this podcast and just going, it, it all kind of clicking at that moment, thinking, all right, this is it. I got to pour myself into that. And just one more thought with that, a very vivid memory I have is I remember you already highlight where I'm from, my commute in and out of Port Authority in New York City every day. And for anybody who's been there before, I mean, you talk about the epitome of the rat race. You know, it's literally, you know, thousands of people and literal rats, you know, running along the side in Port Authority in New York, going to their jobs, pushing through. And I remember listening to, to the podcast and just pausing it and, and having this light bulb moment and being like, I, I need to do this. You know, this is something that I think is really that next step in kind of setting up my financial life. And that's kind of where it began. The light bulb moment has more than one meanings. It first meant I got to move, but it kind of meant the same thing. I got to move. I got to do something new. So I, I like that analogy. So how long did it take you to take action, to deploy capital from your learning process when you started listening to podcasts? Did you meet anybody in person? How did you get from point A to point B? Yeah, great question. So I'm someone that when I find a topic I'm engaged with and interested in, I'm huge on learning and education and knowledge, and I throw myself into it. So I have these vivid memories of just consuming hours and hours and hours of podcast content, of course, finding my way to the bigger, bigger pockets forums, reading as many blog posts as I can. And before I even started reaching out, engaging with people, just trying to understand essentially what could go wrong. <laughs> I'm a very positive individual, but I'm definitely a critical and a cynic when it comes to you know, what's the way that this doesn't work out? So trying to understand that. And, you know, once I started getting on the phone and talking to sponsors, that was the biggest question I asked. I said, you know, what kind of makes my my wife turn to me and say, I told you so. I told you this was a bad idea. What could go wrong with these deals? So that was a lot of my education. I would say I started hearing about it in early 2019. And by the end of the summer of 2019, was when I wrote that first uh, check and did that first wire transfer for syndication. And you want to talk about a scary feeling, you know, going into that bank and, you know, aside from the actual transaction of my personal residence, never moving that much money anywhere. That'll test you. I remember walking out of the bank and kind of going, well, you know, that was that. And it wasn't with uh, with LifeBridge. It was with a different sponsor. <laughs> it was just, you know, crossing my fingers of, I just sent a ton of money to someone I've never met in person. And, and I hope this goes well. And, and it has, fortunately, with that particular deal. And of course, with everything since then. What was it like jumping on the phone? Were you intimidated? Were, did you have like a list of prepared questions? What yeah. was going through your mind when you got a hold of the sponsor? That's a great question. I think I have a little bit of a leg up being that most of my career has been on the phone, talking to people, vetting situations, asking questions, you know, being a sales professional active listening. I think for me, I would just listen to these sponsors on all the different podcasts they were on and making sure that the story aligned and the timeline checked out and what led them to become a real estate syndicator. Why did they want to go into this field and making sure that their values aligned with mine, making sure that they're putting as an investor, my best interest first, as well as uh, the people that they're providing both employment for and of course, residency for was very important to me. But I think as I got on the phone with them, you know, you started to learn what questions to ask. I had some experiences that weren't great. I had some people tell me you shouldn't really be here, <laughs> which obviously I didn't move forward and invest with those people. But I think that was something that over time I was able to piece together of what, what questions I wanted to ask. What did I need to hear and start developing those relationships? And I think for me, I picked up early on that, you know, that relationship aspect is critical really trusting the sponsor, understanding what are they going to do when the, the situation kind of goes from what was on the pro forma and on the page to reality. And mm -hmm. as we talked about when we were prepping, I think I experienced that very early on in my investing experience, being that I started investing in late 2019, and we know what was around the corner at the beginning of 2020. So it was an interesting time to, to kind of try out my might in this this new investing space when I got started. So what happened when that, like when, when the news came out, were you like, I know I shouldn't have done this or, <laughs> or were you still holding out hope? I mean, sure. Well, I, you kind of like go to worst case scenario and be like, it's, if it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. I mean, everything, I mean, that whole timeline of, of 
you know, that first quarter of March was insane. Um, I had invested in two deals at that point in summer of 2019, in December of 29, or maybe November of 2019. So I remember in January getting like the first ever two distributions and how exciting that was, you know, and yeah. obviously sent out a lot of capital. So you get those first two distributions. I was like, okay, this, this is going to work. Like this is some consistent income. Look at this. I didn't yeah. do anything to get this extra income. And then by April, you know, both of those operations said, hey, you know what? We're suspending distributions for the foreseeable future. So that was that moment of just like, man, am, am I cut out for this? Did I mess up? And we actually sold that condo at the time. So we had some liquid capital to make a decision with. I remember right in, in March 2020 as the stock market was going down, but I was resolute at that point in terms of my education of, you know, really believing in the real estate space. That's when I got into a, a great deal with with the Stratus Apartments with LifeBridge, which turned out going great. But I think that was a, a true test for me, that three-month window where I made the decision, no, I'm going to lean in. I'm going to push into the real estate because I believe in it. Uh, and it was a great time to buy, obviously. Mm -hmm. This is the question. And by the way, for my first two LP syndications, I intentionally had them mail me checks just so I could experience the pleasure of opening a check <laughs> and holding it in my hand and doing snapshot deposit. Because sometimes when things go automatically and it's just, you're not, I don't know, for me, like the dopamine centers don't get triggered the same way. <laughs> it's yeah. Holding it, it you know, real. it makes it tangible. You're, you're, you're actually touching, you know, the, the physical experience of, of what you're doing at that time. Yes. Okay. This is a question that I like to ask passive investors just because of even how I experienced it. What was going through your mind the first time that someone sent you the PPM and said, okay, sign this and send us the money? Was it 90 yeah. pages? How long was it? <laughs> like I said, I, I I like to delve into things. So it was absolutely some hundred page document. And, you know, I remember that the first 30 pages is just a little bunch of definitions and jargon. And you're looking for the splits that align because the, the marketing materials, you know, the slide deck is usually so pretty when you get the investment summary and it, it's so enticing. And then you get the PPM and it's like, oh, this is what it really is. It's like computer code almost. <laughs> and then you get to that section that's all about the risks, right? Here's here's yes. 10 pages of every single thing that can go wrong with this deal. Again, when you take a step back, you can really appreciate the transparency, the honesty of what needs to be done there. I kept going back to the sense, you know, and I'd almost floated out to all of my friends who none of them are interested in this stuff. All of them are super skeptical. They think, wait, what? You're, you're investing in apartments in Idaho? What are you doing? You know, and, and being a, a guy on the Northeast, like, it's just unheard of. But let people kind of pick it apart. But at the end of the day, you're still acquiring these assets that are tangible, you know, buildings with hundreds of units. And what would have to go wrong for the submarket to be so off the all the the patterns of job growth and occupancy and everything that's trending in the right way what would have to go wrong for that asset to really go all the way down to the point where i'd lose my investment you know you're really looking at a long list of events that would need to go out there so can it happen of course but i think for me that was some of the justification of let me make sure i get the sponsors right who know what they're doing and then go from yeah. there in terms of their expertise and, and everything will follow. That's so key. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah. It can be pretty overwhelming. So I, I wish that I would have had folks, you know, when I did that to kind of walk me through it or hold my hand or say, it's, it's going to be okay. Just get through it. And I, you can't leave it to the last two nights to scan yeah. through before you go to bed. I remember, I mean, I remember I'd take the document and I'd, I'd say to my wife, like, Hey, listen, this is going to take me four or five hours just to start yeah. getting through and then maybe come back to it the next day and, and circle the certain things and, you know, get on the phone with the sponsors and, and ask them the questions of things of, hey, can you explain this to me just a little bit more detail? Or what is this trying to communicate here? Because uh, of course, they should be well versed on that, even if they have had legal put it together for them. And that makes me feel better in terms of reviewing it and, and hearing the response of what they're trying to get at there and what they're trying to protect against. Sure. Yes. Okay. So since you started, you went, you told us about point A to point B, how many syndications are you in now? Yeah. So I've probably invested with somewhere around eight or nine different sponsors have gone into maybe 14 or 15 types of deals. I really at first tried to go the, the hyper diversification route between types of deals and sponsors and even size amounts of the deals, just because I'm trying to learn everything. And, and you know, the best way is to sometimes be in it in real time. So have spread out across 
self-storage into an RV park. That's a whole story of how that's gone up and down some different kind of more esoteric type of things that factoring companies in terms of alternative investments. So really I've just tried to look around and diversify the portfolio. And for me, the goal was just to see kind of a sizable cash flow come in month over month and, you know, transform both my personal portfolio, but then also what influence can that have on my lifestyle and you know what directions can i do that so that's been really encouraging to see in the last several years of how quickly that's been able to grow and then i'm sure we can go into it of some of the the lifestyle decisions that's led to for myself personally yeah i want to get to that next but first i want to ask you do you have a a metric or a system for how you divide up what asset classes that you go into some people are you know 20% one asset class 20% another i won't do more than X amount. Do you have any rhyme or reason or, or do you go on gut? So the first couple of years and the first probably six to eight deals was just let's keep diversifying sponsors, finding really solid sponsors that their vision aligns with mine, their goals align with mine. I understand their reasoning for being in the space. Um, and then beyond that, it has gotten a little more challenging because I've had to decide, do I continue to invest with the sponsors who I've seen have, have performed well for me and I understand their their value system and I understand what will happen when things go south because they've had to work on that in certain deals? Or do I continue to do this hyper diversification? It's been tough. I mean, the past couple of years, I've been looking for mobile home parks to get into and just haven't had the right alignment of the deal at the right timing. Like I said, I kind of consider myself a, a lucky guy who's been fortunate to be good at his profession. So it's not like I have capital just, just coming in all the time. You know, I have to be very selective annually with which deals am I looking to invest in or, you know, in certain circumstances, I'm just taking from either equity events or dispositions or, you know, refinances. And that's the money that I have to redeploy. So I think at this point in time, 2023, when we're recording this, everyone's kind of slowing down and thinking through things a little bit more. I know today versus four years ago, understanding metrics. And I remember last year, even I had that epiphany moment where I was like, I need to understand the debt terms of every single deal that I'm in, you know, it was something that I'm sure back in 2020 and 2021, I overlooked a little bit as a newer investor. And now it's much more important to me to understand, okay, what's the financing terms? Are we doing a three-year bridge loan? What's the plan after five years? Will it go to 10 years? Is that possible? Are there caps on you know where the interest rate can be? So I think I've gotten more sophisticated in terms of what I'm looking at from the metrics perspective. And in terms of diversification, I'm still attracted to the physical diversica diversification across the country. But I think I'm getting more comfortable with when you kind of have those good jockeys, you stick with them. I'm sure Whitney will appreciate that with his horse background there. But I think that's really important of, of finding the sponsors that you trust that are going to do right by the investors no matter what. Totally agree. When you're looking over a uh, investment summary, just like the key data points, what are the things where you're like, no, I'm not into this deal. What What's going to cause you to immediately roll your eyes and just toss that yeah. summary? I think the cap rate assumptions of, of what the, the exit cap will be and where it is right now, the debt service coverage ratio I'm, I'm paying special attention to, break-even occupancy I want to understand. What is the value-add component? If there is one, does it really seem feasible in terms of what they're anticipating and expecting? My experience is that there's going to always be construction delays or construction issues, especially if there's not the vertical integration, if it's if they're going outside. So just trying to understand those key things to look at. I think less experienced investors initially are just really enticed by the pro forma numbers. And I've already fortunately gotten to that place where I think just because this particular deal says they're going to have the highest pref or the highest IRR and the shortest amount of sale period doesn't necessarily mean it's the best deal. You know, you have to dig deeper and and maybe at the point where you're okay with the sponsors who saying, hey, you know, this is more of a realistic picture. Well, great. If you can hit the realistic picture versus maybe get to the, the ideal situation, I'll take that that realistic picture every single time. Yeah, and that's really key. I mean, when, you know, I'm in investor relations. And so when I'm onboarding new investors, I, I try to be really upfront and transparent and clear with them that when you're doing a value add deal, there's a stabilization process. and so. As you know, I think folks can come on board thinking it's going to be this and we want to under promise and over deliver, but not always there are things. And so I, I always really encourage people to evaluate what your risk tolerance is, you know, because there's also new construction deals that you can invest in that have lower risk, you know, yeah. it may be lower risk, lower reward. It may not be. 
but the value adds certainly have the bumpy ride factor or they can yeah. um, at the beginning, you know, you can, you can do your due diligence on a property. There's just some coffins that are buried deeper than what your shovel is going to find when you visit. <laughs> so you know, Having kind of the sales background, I think while I'm both enamored by a good sales presentation, a good sales pitch, the, the shiny marketing materials, I think it's also given me a sense of is someone trying to oversell this versus educate. And mm-hmm. so much of modern sales and sales theory and sales technique is just to bring information to people. Let them make the ultimate decision, but keep them well informed. And I think, you know, your role and your job, you probably relate to this, uh, you know, exactly that. It's just about making sure people are well informed and you're giving them all the things so that they can confidently move forward with something. And I think that's something I'm always looking at with my interactions with sponsors, both through their materials as well as all of their communication, right? What what's their online social media presence? What's the written communication? Are they trying to, I don't want to say beg for money, but maybe be a little bit too aggressive in their approach to to acquire that versus do they have the confidence that they know if they put good good opportunities out there? the capital is going to come to them. And I think that's really important, but that then creates this interesting scenario. If we had a time period where deals were filling up in like a six hour window. Now, I think that might be beyond us with uh, the current state of the market. But I think that's also just another thing to point out as a passive investor is just keeping up to date, because I think I didn't have an appreciation for how quickly things can change in this space. And Seeing that last year with the the mortgage rates just spike up like they did, you and I were talking about some of just the the financial news going on today, is just really staying abreast of of what's going on in the day-to-day. And I continue to embrace that of just educate, 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 stay knowledgeable, talk to people about this, because I don't think you can can get to rest too too easy in terms of one idea or one philosophy, because that could be dangerous. Things are always moving, I think. Yes. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question, then we're going to move on to the bigger why, the lifestyle, what it's really, what fruit, what fruit this is producing for you. So when you're on the phone or we're on the phone with, you know, vetting sponsors, tell me about an experience where you were like, "Mm, no, what, what is off putting to you? Uh, You said that some said you don't, you know, you're, you don't fit our criteria more or less, but aside from, from that, like all things equal, what did you walk away with? Like one call in particular, if you can think of something. Where you were, you just had a sour taste in your mouth. Yeah, I think the thing that stands out to me are the sponsors who actually want to get to know me, mm-hmm. understand what my motivation is for investing. If they're really good, good, they'll be able to zero in on on my concerns pretty quickly. And in the early days, I would even say that was a fear. You know, it was I'd never done anything like this. This this whole concept of of wiring a check for this amount of money seemed absurd to me, frankly. So I needed the sponsors who were were going to not comfort me, but but make me understand, you know, the steps that are included in this. The sponsors where they were very brash, you know, maybe didn't want to offer that education, which I think is important for early investors, because as we talked about in four years, I've blossomed to, you know, having a, a decent enough portfolio. You know, I've done done 15 different deals, but I do recall that first uh, sponsor where they told me, you're not cut out for this. You know, you, you don't have enough experience in this space. Wow. You shouldn't be really looking at this. Um, I was talking to a, a private equity person earlier who, you know, he, he knew what he was doing. He's been doing, he's VP of this and that. That just kind of threw me for a loop. I didn't expect that getting on the call with this individual. So, you know, just how you treat people really at the end of the day, right? That's that's part of what it comes down to of you're always going to find people who are looking out for themselves first versus, you know, looking to kind of look out for everybody. So that's that stands out for sure. Very good. Okay, let's let's transition a little bit to the satin household. (laughs) <laughs> what what is the reverse engineering goal that you're sure. working towards right now? Sure, that's a great question because I think it, it changes quite a bit. I think for anybody who are parents can relate to that. I think uh, introducing new members into your family at any time kind of throw things for a loop. And you know we're no different. Me and my wife have two two younger children. I think pre kids we were both very career focused, career oriented. Continue to stick with that through you know having the two children. I think just during those pandemic years, work from home, both of us being in very client facing roles where a lot of our jobs required us to be on the phone. It just became kind of untenable. She reached a point where she actually got 
uh, a great promotion into a, a new role for herself. And it had us re-examine our lifestyle a little bit more. And because we now suddenly had this pretty reliable passive income coming in every month that could cover a certain portion of our expenses. It allowed us to make some changes where it's today I, I work part time for my company that I've been with for for quite a long time now, 12 years, wonderful working relationship with them. And I love the people that I work with. So we've been really able to work out a fantastic arrangement where a couple of days a week, I'm, I'm uh, working for them. The majority of the time during the week, I'm able to be home and be dad and, you know, handle all of the, the domestic responsibilities at home. And I've become a, a great chef in the last year since we transitioned to this. And it's allowed my wife to really focus on her career and something that she's really engaged with and it's just been a good balance. And I think that's what we're all sometimes seeking out, you know, balance in life. You know, while it's great to look at big goals and big picture, sometimes it's just the day to day. You know, we were talking earlier, my, my son's been sick lately and I got to stay home with him. He's five years old and just play board games all morning, you know, and, and kind of keep his mind off of being sick and entertain him. And, and those are the things that I feel like when you look back at life are, are what makes up core memories and experiences and things that I recall with my own family growing up of, of things that stood out to me. It's not you know, anything major, it's it's those little fleeting moments that you just try not to take for granted at the time. So I feel like the, the passive income has allowed a lifestyle, even at this point, even with not this tremendous portfolio to make some pretty big changes at this stage in my career. I think you made such a good point there, just about even playing board games with your son and establishing those those core memories. Because Here's the, like, the truth is if you're the busier you are, the bigger bang you feel like you need for your buck to make those core memories with your kids, you yeah. know? So whether you're driven by guilt or you're driven by, you know, just a real longing to be with them. I, I love what you said about just stop what you're doing. Give them the ibuprofen, let them feel better and enjoy <laughs> the game with them. That's hard for those of us who have home offices and in that balance, but you're so right. You know, at the end of it, those are the things that are going to matter the most that seem like petty inconveniences, but I love that your, your call to, to action, to just do small things that develop core memories. I mean, I have those memories when I was a kid, what, what it was like when you're sick and you, you did get special treatment. So I'm memories. encouraged by that. One of my favorite memories is I remember a day with my father where I don't know why he wasn't working, but we had the whole day. And I remember he said, you you can pick what we do today. You get to plan the whole schedule. And I remember writing in in a list form and really bad handwriting. So I had to be young of just what we were going to do. And it was go to the arcade, go to the movies, go get pizza. And we followed that list. And, you know, 30 years later, I still remember that day with my father. And it's one of my most favorite thing. So I, I think about that a lot of how can I create as many possible days like that for my kids and, and do things. And, you know, I think just it's it's OK to, to, to slow down life a little bit. I think that's very counter to what a lot of people in, in hustle culture and, and I've been part of that. But just trying to, to think about what matters most and how can I formulate that around that around my life versus getting swept up in more, 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 more. Would I love to have a uh, passive income of, of $20,000 a month? Sure. Who wouldn't? But do I need passive income of that amount? That's, that's the bigger question for me. Yeah. And I think too, we tend to like, as our income grows and our mindset shifts, we tend to want to, I don't know, spend more money to have those core memories. So yeah. I was just talking to somebody recently and saying, I've recently transitioned to coming, coming back to work after being with the kids for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so look, thinking creative creatively about how to have impactful time that's memorable. I feel like I'm willing to do things that I would have been so inconvenienced by <laughs> before, you know, like as a family at the end of the day, I mean, it's not right now because it's uh, March and it's cold, but okay, let's jump in the pool with our clothes on, or let's yeah. have dessert on the roof or, yeah. you know, do things that are just kind of bothersome by way of I need to go dry all these clothes now or, or yeah. whatever, but they're free and they're wonderful. And your kids are like, oh my gosh, my family's so fun. Yeah. My dad's just playing board games with me. So I, I love that. And it's fleeting, you know, and I think I, I've, I've really enjoyed you've, you've definitely shared on the podcast before some of the personal stories and anecdotes about your father. And I think for me, that always sticks with me. You know, my daughter's eight years old. She's starting to get to that point where already, you know, maybe it, dad makes her feel a little bit, you know, embarrassed. Uh, I know holding hands, crossing the street, going to her school. She's like, dad, okay, we're done holding hands now. But last summer, for example, we got tickets that to the- too the, young. That is too yes, young I know. to not hold daddy's hand hands. As we approach school. But, you know, we got, <laughs> we got tickets to the local water park and we were able to go a bunch of days during the week to the local water park. And just 
you know, had I been employed full time, while it affords other things, that would have never been able to happen. And, and those are our memories now already. And I'm looking forward to this upcoming summer of repeating that and, and you know, doing the same thing. So that's that's what I'm really trying to focus on at this point, along with whatever else I can do to, to, to make my life better in, in other facets. You know, it's just day by day. That is so good. Yeah. Whitney had Jim Shields on, I don't know, it was last summer, but in case anyone missed that episode, he wrote a book called The Family Board Meeting. And so our family has implemented this where every quarter, my husband and I trade off because we both work. So it's kind of like the, the working parent or the one who's less available does the board meetings. Either parent can do it and, and should do it, but the point is that they get meaningful time. And so this quarter was my quarter with the kids. And they're always like, mom, when's my board meeting? And it's four <laughs> hours. That's they awesome. get to pick whatever we do. It's no t- like no phones, no movies, like no tech. You're allowed to use your phone for photos and that's it. You nice. share a meal together. I mean, there's some like simple parameters that the book outlines and the kids are like, oh, I love board meetings, you know? So they, they look forward to them and they look back to them. And I'm, I'm grateful for the, the new tradition. So that's awesome. That's wonderful. Yeah. Okay. I want to ask another question. How do you keep track of so many different syndications? Do you have just spreadsheet after spreadsheet or what are, <laughs> what's, what's your secret and how sure. can we learn from you? Sure. So it definitely started with, with spreadsheets and just trying to keep everything organized and put as much information in there as possible, trying to hear how other people did their spreadsheets. And then uh, I, I'm sure they're, they're starting to come into the space, but I got connected with the the folks from Visor pretty early on and talking to them about the tool they were developing. I was like, yep, bing, this is this is what I'm hoping to have. So, you know, Visor is just a great platform that allows you to have everything automated in there. It's automatically cl- cl- uh, giving you all of your different metrics and stats and links up to your account of seeing when your distributions are hitting your account and letting you know if it's above or below and definitely a powerful tool as you build your portfolio. So it's a combination of Visor, my own, my own Excel. And yeah, it's a lot to keep track of. It definitely is. And especially come tax time and try not to drive my accountant crazy with all the extension of taxes and all the K-1s. So you know, staying organized is important. So do you file for extension every year? I think from here on out, I'm going to. I did for the first time last year and just kind of assumed. But again, that goes back to that education and knowledge of, I remember remember looking forward to that because I remember reading it in a form somewhere of like, you're not really doing it right or you're not really invested enough if you don't have to file an extension. So last year when it was very clear that I would have to file an extension, I'm like, all right, this is good, right? That I'm not going to. Day ones until the end of September, no names mentioned, but you know, things happen. I understand it. I don't think it's, it's typically not the sponsor's fault, right? There's, there's going to be a lot of things in play in my day job. I work with accountants and things like that. So I know how slow moving things can be and holdups happen. So, yes. So how often do you check in with your spreadsheet and this app or this platform visor? Are you doing this every day? Are you doing it once a week? Are you doing it once a month? What's your MO? Probably too much. (laughs) You know, the idea of passive income is you want it to be passive and in the background, ideally. But, you know, I think it's it's always good to go in and fiddle around and see the different levers of, oh, well, what if this goes up and what if this distribution goes this way? You know, it's interesting in this environment that we're we're back to a place where some sponsors are pausing distributions and obviously there'll be the catch up with for returns. But just trying to measure for that, especially having a, a reliancy now on some of that passive income, it's important. So yeah, I definitely try to stay in tune with everything that's going on and, and look at the stuff pretty often. But I, I also enjoy the days that I don't because it shouldn't be front of mind all the time. You know, I think everything has a time and place. So trying to, to, to keep everything organized mentally as well. Oh, that's helpful. What tips would you give uh, someone who's, I guess, uh, we'll start with and I'll, I'll follow up with another question, but what tips would you give somebody who's just new to passive investing and is overwhelmed with everything that you just mentioned, where should they start? That's tough. Overwhelmed is tough because I was going to, before you finish that question, I was going to say, educate, 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 get yourself to the point of being overwhelmed. I think once you become overwhelmed, maybe then working backwards and distilling it down. At the end of the day, you're making educated guesses, conjectures, I guess, on all the information available on on people and places and, and things. So I think it's important to really get, feeling good about something. I think a a concept that I really like is resulting. And it's this concept of you can do all the right research, do all the right things, but then what if at the end of the day, things don't work out the way that they're supposed to? And I'm in a deal now that's 
exactly that's happening, right? The sponsor did all the right things. The deal's going completely sideways. There was a, a theft at the property. The people who were supposed to be uh, building it up, it's not going as it's supposed to. And I'm hoping to just get my initial capital back. I'm not mad at myself. You know, and I think that's really important. Some people will have a tendency to blame themselves and think, oh, I, sh I should have done it differently. I think as an investor, do the right things up to a certain point. And then, yeah, you will have to take action at some point because, you know, it's it's you're never going to really determine if this is for you if you don't take that action. I'm so glad that I did have that experience I alluded to back in 2019 and 2020 and continued to push forward with it and then say, now nah, this this real estate stuff is not for me. Even the passive investing, you know, this is this is uh, not going well because I wouldn't have had the opportunities that's afforded now. Yeah, I like what you said about immerse yourself. It's almost liberating to say, I'm just going to go get overwhelmed because there's some of us who want to throw our arms around absolutely everything, understand every facet of it, and there is such liberation in knowing it's just going to take time. So take it easy yes. on yourself and just assume that knowledge or new information is going to pass over your brain scientifically. What is it? Seven times before it fully absorbs it. Yep. So then you're free and not having to stop and read it really slowly every time to yeah. understand everything about it. Okay. So what kind of advice would you give a more advanced investor? What are you learning? Like what's one of your lessons learned or something that you want to pr press into and pursue? Yeah. Understand debt markets. <laughs> That's a big one of understanding right now. I think for me, the, the methodology and terminology and trying to understand the underwriting a little bit better is important. I think trying to take a couple steps back and think about where things are going to go. I think there's some people in the space who do a really good job of talking about the future. And of course, no one knows what the future holds, but taking that into account, you know, what do apartment complexes look like in five years, 10 years, 20 years? How will we live? You know, if anyone could have anticipated the, the work from home push five years ago, that would change a lot of decisions. What's going on with transportation? What's going on with the jobs market? So, Trying to be better of thinking about those big picture things. Like, like I said, I, I'm just a lucky guy at this point, you know, who, who kind of fell into this of, of finding something he was good at in terms of sales, being able to invest in these types of deals. So I'm very humble when it comes to that. But I think there's no limit on where you can take your education and trying to get better with that and never being absolute in anything either. Let your opinions be changed. I think that's really important that some people get so attached to mm. thinking things in one way and they cannot see the other side. And this space is such a good example of this, right? Because there's always a buyer and a seller. Think about that. One person's always thinking this property is not for me anymore. The other person's seeing the opportunity. So I would challenge more senior, or more experienced investor do the same thing. See things from both sides, try to understand both sides and then make decisions for yourself based off of that. That is so good. And I'll close with this because I, I think, Isaac, one thing I really appreciate about you is you're, you're, you're an evangelist for what you love, but you're teachable by way of you're a student of your surroundings and the iterative times that we're living in. And so I appreciate your enthusiasm. I mean, you are kind of the Pied Piper with Real estate syndication, you're getting everybody in the door and it's great. But I also like your student approach, your lifelong learning approach. And I think that the, the combination of that is, hey, this is exciting and, and I want to continue to learn. I think you're going to win as long as you keep yourself open. So thank you so much for being a guest on the show. I'd love to have you back sometime in the future. Anything you want to say in closing or anything that's burning on your on your mind? No, I think this was uh, an awesome experience. I love listening. I love that you guys are doing more focus on the passive investors as well. Um, because, you know, hearing just other people who are in my shoes, I mean, that's how I got started, right? Of just listening to different people's paths and, and hearing others' journeys is, is wonderful. And I encourage everyone to always reach out and connect with each other because I think that's where all the knowledge is shared in, in that instance as well. So, you know, learning together is huge for this space. I love the community. I know best ever uh, just took place. And, and I'm hoping in future years, I'll be able to be there and be a little bit more uh, of a physical presence in, in within this world. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Isaac. I'm grateful for the time. And I'm sure we'll talk again back here on the show. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for joining us on today's show. Don't forget to like and subscribe and tell your friends about us. Thanks so much for listening.